In this episode of Reaching for My Roots, I delve into the intriguing story of John Gordon, born in January 1814 on the Isle of Bute in Scotland. Uncovering the records, I discovered that he was deemed the natural-born son of Grizel Ferguson and Joseph Gordon, a labourer hailing from Ireland. During this era, there was a considerable migration between Scotland and Ireland, explaining Joseph's Scottish surname and his commonly Irish first name. And incidentally, the Gordon name resonates strongly in my recent family. My paternal grandfather's name is Gordon, as is the middle name of my dad and my oldest son. DNA research has led me to believe that Joseph's parents were John Gordon and Mary Malloy of Limerick in Ireland. Keep that in mind as this location turns up again later on. From what I can gather, John Sr. spent some time in Jamaica, either as a soldier or sailor. That's something I'll be spending more time researching into at a later date. What I do know is that some of John Sr.'s descendants ended up in the United States around Utah after initially being around the New York, New Jersey, sort of New England area. And they were involved in the Underground Railway, which was a secret network charged with helping slaves escape from the southern states prior to emancipation, which was in the 1860s. The exact town of John Jr.'s birth remains elusive, but the records indicate that it could have been Rothsey, the bustling main town located in the beautiful Isle of Bute, which is off Scotland's western coast. On September 6, 1821, young John was christened in Rothsey with his grandfather, Bryce Ferguson, a cooper by trade, serving as his sponsor. Although I couldn't uncover categoric earlier records of this Gordon family, the ancient parish registers for Butte provide us with a glimpse of Grizel's ancestry, tracing back to the early 1700s. The property names mentioned in the records, such as Treehouse, Kilmory, and Ackervillag, I've probably butchered that, but I've done my best, are slightly obscured due to the illegibility of the old hair and handwritten, sorry, documents. My investigation also uncovered a fascinating entry into the 1663 Rossay Town Council Minutes, mentioning a Donald Ferguson, who was a boatman and is likely a relative and possibly even the uh, great-grandfather of Grizel. And my own grandfather used to tell me stories of how this branch of our family was associated with the Royal Stuart family through an illegitimate child of Bonnie King Charles II. Now, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to prove it, but I'm claiming it because it sounds cool, even if he was a bit of a knob who liked to stick parts of his body in places they probably weren't all that welcome. Remarkably, the three properties mentioned in the old parish registers still exist today's dairy farms. And through recent photographs that I've seen, the farmhouses at Kilmory and Ackervillag still exist, although the farmhouse at Treehouse Farm unfortunately no longer stands. Nearby Cames Castle, a structure dating back to the 14th century, remains intact, albeit with some demolition and reconstruction carried out by the Marquess of Butte after his acquisition of the lands in 1910. The six cottages adjacent have been converted into self-catering tourist accommodations, ensuring the preservation and maintenance of these historic premises. Exploring the picturesque town of Rothsay with Rothsay Castle at its centre, now in ruins, significant portions of the outer walls, entryway and chapel have withstood this test of time. The castle is now surrounded by a grassy park, further from the ocean than during its actual construction. Interestingly enough, Rossay Castle's origins can be traced back to around 1098 when the Viking Magnus Bearlegs arrived from Norway to conquer the Scottish islands. Over the years, it's changed hands between the Norsemen and the Scots and back and forth and forth and back and so on, with some notable attacks occurring in 1230 and 1263, which was a pretty turbulent period, the 13th century in Scotland and in England as well. 
So Margaret Guthrie, who's not my own ancestor, and her marriage to John Gordon was sealed in 1846 in the quaint East Ayrshire village of Golston. So at some point, John's moved across to the mainland. And this was John's first of two marriages, with the wedding taking place in the newly built Church of Scotland, the structure that now stands as a testament to the passage of time. The first child, George Guthrie Gordon, arrived in 1847 in New Mills in Ayrshire, a village with an extensive history that came to life with the establishment of corn mills and a subsequent granting of a charter in 1490. This moment marked the official recognition of the village, which against all odds has maintained its small size and charm throughout the centuries. Little did John and Margaret know at that particular time that their family's future would soon be reshaped by unseen forces. And the exact reasons behind their subsequent decision to emigrate from Scotland to Australia do remain elusive. However, historical context offers a range of possibilities that could have been good reasons why. The devastating potato blight induced famine that plagued Ireland and Western Scotland during that period may have influenced their choice. And living near the bustling seaport of Glasgow, John would have been exposed to tales of adventure in distant lands, igniting a desire to seek new horizons. So there's a possibility there. But also the breakdown of the clan system and the haunting memory of the Highland clearances drove countless Scots to embrace emigration as a way of life. Many found themselves in Canada, where the city of Rothsay now stands as a testament to their resilience. Uh, perhaps the Gordons were part of a close-knit group journeying together with familiar faces and shared dreams. They might also have received favourable reports from those who had already made the journey to Australia, beckoning them towards a better future. Yet another possible influence on their decision was politics. It's conceivable that Margaret and John were connected to the nationwide Chartist movement, which sought a demographic or democratic, my apologies, parliamentary system through force. In Luton Parish, the movement gained momentum after the passing of the first reform bill in 1832, which granted voting rights to a mere 98 individuals out of a population of around 3,000. Such a limited franchise sparked radical sentiments among the Chartists, but the government prevailed, leading to the movement's demise by 1848. Some members were even compelled to flee the country. In this context, the Gordons' timely departure may have shielded them from a tumultuous aftermath. As fate would also have it, a cholera epidemic ravaged New Mills in 1848 and 1849, claiming numerous lives, particularly those of the young and elderly. The Gordons' decision to embark on their new journey spared them from the deadly grip of this calamity. The decision to board the Lady McNaughton, a ship that departed London in July 1847, carrying hopeful migrants from Scotland to the promising shores of South Australia, was driven by various motives, but one clear incentive was the significant savings it offered. While fares from Scottish ports to South Australia amounted to around £30 per person, those departing from the Port of London can enjoy a savings of approximately £5 each for canny Scots like the Gordons, this was a considerable sum of money and an opportunity too good to pass up. And look, we all know that Scots are tight asses. It's no secret. They own it. By today's standards, the conditions on board were nothing short of appalling. Passengers endured poor foods, scarce fresh water, and almost non-existent bathing and toilet facilities. Their only solace was a bucket of salt water and a sponge. Coupled with these hardships were the relentless boredom, cramped and unlit living conditions, and the constant danger posed by storms and sickness. Yet our resilient migrants persevered through it all. John and Margaret were accompanied by their young son, George, who was just seven months old at the time, and having an infant on board presented some serious challenges for the couple. Historical records indicate that the mortality rate for infants during such voyages was tragically high, reaching around 50%. I mean, that's, oh, that's unbelievable, really, isn't it? 
I guess the odds George was fortunate enough to survive this treacherous journey, which is good. A testament to his parents' unwavering determination and I guess his own strength of character, even though he was only a baby at the time. On 13th of October, 1847, the Lady McNaughton finally reached its destination at Port Adelaide. At that time, Adelaide was the sole significant town in the colony of South Australia, which had been settled a mere 11 years earlier under the Wakefield scheme. It was within this budding town that the Gordon family would establish their new home. Over the following years, their family grew with the birth of Jean in 1849, and the Gordon's residence was then located on Giles Street in Adelaide. The youngest child, James, arrived in 1852 while the family still resided on Giles Street. However, unfortunately, tragedy struck the Gordons when Margaret fell victim to dysentery in October of that year. She passed away, leaving behind a two-month-old James. And today, no headstone or marker remains to commemorate her resting place in the West Terrace Cemetery. John married again, this time to Annie Sophia Wilson, my direct ancestor, at Port Elliot on the 25th of April, 1857. Annie's father is listed on the marriage register as William Wilson. However, her death certificate states it to be Richard Trousdale Wilson, occupation civil engineer. William appears to be more likely to be her father, though, and Richard to be her brother. There was a Richard Trasdale Wilson living nearby to the Gulwa region of the right age to be Annie's brother. And I do have his shipping record and a few other subsequent records of his as well. And I do want to say, since this initial line of research, DNA evidence has led me to a connection with the Wilson clan of Limerick City and Trasdale family of Kilrush and County Clare. And what I've been able to unearth is that Annie's parents were, in fact, William Wilson and his wife, Eliza Trasdale. Both descendants of officers in the British military who were awarded land for their services to the infamous Oliver Cromwell in crushing a Catholic rebellion in Ireland during the 1600s. And William's grandfather, Richard, was in fact the Sheriff of Limerick at one stage, which was another reward for his family's service to Oliver Cromwell. John and Annie spent most of their married life at Goolwa, an important port in the colourful riverboat trade era that flourished on the Murray-Darling River system from 1850 until about 1880. They had nine children with the first two dying in childhood, sadly. And my second time's great-grandfather, Bryce Charles, was the third born on the 3rd of May, 1862 at Goolwa. He married Isabella Smith and they had seven children, including my great-grandmother, Isabella Sophie Mary. Um, the family lived in Carlton and Fitzroy after moving to Victoria in 1886. They later resided for a number of years at 12 Caroline Street, Auburn, before a move to Mordialic after the completion of the First World War. Bryce died in the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne on the 1st of August 1929 and was buried at the Cheltenham Old Cemetery along with Isabella, who died in 1928. I do want to mention Bryce's youngest brother, John, who was born in 1873 in Goolwa. And after moving to Melbourne, he married a remarkable woman, Rebecca Ann Irons. They had five children. And John died in January 1956, outliving all of his siblings and was buried at Springvale Botanical Cemetery along with Rebecca, who was notably awarded an MBE, that's a member of the British Empire, in 1954 for her role as president of the RSS AIL Women's Folk. I'm definitely going to be doing an episode on Rebecca and other amazing women throughout my broader family in a future episode, as I really believe they have as much of a story to tell as the men. And quite often the women do get left to the wayside by storytellers and historians. So there's a bit to work with there. There's a few others, really amazing women I want to talk about as well in, when that time comes. So Annie Wilson married John Gordon soon after her arrival at Port Adelaide in August 1855 aboard the Aliqui, which was captained by Tom Payne, who 
was famously um, mentioned in an episode of Who Do You Think You Are, where they focus on his descendant, Jack Thompson, who's a famous Aussie actor. And Tom was a pretty well-known ship's captain that has a pretty good story that was told in that episode of Who Do You Think You Are? And Annie sailed from Liverpool on the ship as well. So she obviously travelled across to the English mainland from Ireland at that time. A family diary recorded that she died in Auburn, Victoria, on the 4th of February, 1916, aged 83 years, a colonist in Australia for 60 years, and she was buried in the Heidelberg Cemetery in grave number nine. Her place of birth is listed on her death certificate as Limerick Island, although her apparent brother Richard was reputedly born in Yorkshire, England, in a town named Wales, which is not to be confused with the country of the same name. It's a little bit west of that location. John spent many years working as a painter and then once he retired, still stayed in Goolwa, where he eventually died of bronchial pneumonia in 1890. He was buried in the Goolwa Cemetery and would have been around 76 years old when he died. And surprisingly, for it turned out to be pretty virile. He was um, 62 years old when his youngest daughter, Sophia, was born. And soon after John's death, Annie moved to Victoria, as I mentioned earlier, and she did live with her married children who had moved east at various different times. Isabella Sophie Mary Gordon married my great-grandfather, Archie McPhee, in Hawthorne in 1915, shortly before he departed for the First World War. Incidentally, Archie's mother, Rabina Smith, was the older sister of Isabella's mother, Isabella Smith, therefore making them first cousins, something that was a lot more common in those days than it is now. Archie's parents had spent a significant amount of time in the Port Elliot district themselves, not far from Goolwa, which is where uh, John Gordon did live for a while as well. And prior to relocating to the Wimmera district of Victoria and then further south to northwest Tasmania, uh, John McPhee, that's Archie's dad, did spend quite a bit of time in the area alongside his parents-in-law and Isabella's grandparents, the Smiths, who lived in Goa for quite a number of generations, actually. Archie was an accomplished junior sportsman in his home state prior to enlisting, excelling at Aussie rules football, cricket, and like many Tasmanians, wood chopping. I'm pretty sure he did a bit of competitive cycling as well. I know his brothers did. And some of the newspaper reports, it just says A. McPhee, which could have been Archie, his brother Albert, his cousin Alan. And I reckon there was another, starting with A, there was a few. Um, some family law suggests he may have played some games of footy for the Hawthorne Football Club before shipping out with the AIF. And look, of course, this is unsubstantiated and not proven. Although he definitely played some games for a local football club and Glen Ferry Oval was probably about 400 metres away from the home he lived in at that stage in Auburn Parade. So look, it's possible. I don't know if I should claim it because I don't, I go for another teams. <laughs> I'm a Fitzroy man from way back. But uh, some of Archie's descendants who uh, step cousins, half cousins, yeah, I think they're half cousins to my dad. They are all Hawthorne supporters, so maybe there's something in that. But I'm going to explore further into Isabella and Archie's legacy in a later episode and a bit more about John McPhee and the Smiths as well because there's a few little interesting stories to tell. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this story and don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any future content. And thanks for listening.